Today we continue our sermon series uh, looking at the Proverbs, those proverbs, those things that we are meant to do, the ways we are meant to live. Now, the last two weeks, I, I admit, have been a little bit more uh, heady type of topics, but today we're going to get to a very intensely practical proverb for our lives. As we prepare to hear God's word, please bow your heads with me at this time. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for giving us the wisdom of your word to guide and direct each day of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the hope and promise of salvation. Lord, lead us by your Holy Spirit that each day we might live to serve you by serving others, by loving others, by caring for others as you have first loved us. We thank you, O Lord, for the gift of your creation and the beauty thereof. Help us to always recognize your hand at work within your creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you sit, stop to think about God's creation, it's almost overwhelming. It's immense. It's beyond measurement. I, I don't know, when you stop to think of God's creation, what immediately comes to your mind? Do you immediately think of the seas that, that are boundless or, 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 or the universe that continues to expand with stars and planets that we still have yet to catalog? What comes to your mind? I think so often, uh, maybe if you're like me at least, when we stop to think of God's creation, we think of the immensity of it. But today the author of Proverbs <laughs> asks us to look at a very small part of God's creation. Today the author of Proverbs invites us to, to stop and, and look at a part of creation that maybe sometimes we might not even think about. Well, at least if we think about it, it's more of an irritant than anything else. I invite you to turn with me to Proverbs at this time, to back to Proverbs chapter 6. And I want you to go back to the text for the, for the Old Testament today. I want you to go back with me as, as we look at this text that, that invites us to go to the ant. So please turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6. It's, it's page 531 in those reddish Bibles if you'd like to follow along in the reddish Bibles. If you have your smartphone with you and would like to follow along on your smartphone, we'll be using the English standard version of the text. Although NIV is pretty close on this one, uh, so whichever you prefer. But we'll be reading from uh, Proverbs chapter 6, page 531 in those reddish Bibles. And uh, we're going to go to verse 6 now. And verse 6 starts off exactly where we're starting today. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and, and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O oh sluggard? When, you will, when will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to the rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Go to the ant, so the author of Proverbs invites us. Go to the ant, and, and, and what will we get when we go to the ant? Wisdom. Go to the ant and be wise. Now when you stop to think of the ant, we, we have an immediate reason why we should go to the ant. The ant prepares in advance. Did you notice that? That is a, that is a very truth of the ant colonies. Ants prepare in advance, and, and each ant has a job to do as they prepare for winter, as they prepare for the changes of the season. Each ant has a job to do. Some ants, they, they have this special pheromone that when they travel, other ants can follow them to find the food. And other ants, they, they take care of the young. They look after the eggs and they look after uh, the, the baby ants. And, and others, of course, the queen ant you know, makes the babies. And then you have, of course, ants that are, have special heads probably not with any hair in either. And, and they protect hole, the holes so that other ants cannot invade. Uh, ants have learned to work together, but, but that's not exactly what the author of Proverbs wants us to learn today, is it? The author of Proverbs doesn't get at, we, although very good to think about a community of believers and, and how we should live together and how each of us has our, our unique job and purpose in this community, uh, uh, but that's, that's not what the text is getting at, is it? Go to the ant, and to who goes to the ant? Oh, sluggard. Remember, these first Proverbs were probably written by Solomon, writing these to be passed on to his son, passed on to his daughters, passed on to his children. Go to the ant, O sluggard. A warning 
Now, a sluggard is a little bit older term, although I think we still know what it means. Maybe a, a synonym might be uh, lazy bones. Go to the, the ant, oh, lazy bones. Go to the ant, you who is lazy in living. Now, I, I don't know if you've thought about this much, but have you stopped to think about laziness as a sin? Have you stopped to think about laziness as a sin when you hear texts of the scripture like Paul who speaks to the church in Thessalonica and then and, and, uh, he who d well, shall not work shall not eat. I think a lot of times we think of laziness almost more uh, the consequences you won't eat, the consequences poverty. But, but here in Proverbs, we, we have this idea that, that laziness is more than just uh, earthly consequences, but there's a heavenly aspect to it. There, there's a part of... Uh, of where our heart is that's important when it comes to laziness. Now, now, before I go any further, I'm not speaking to those of you who need a little bit of rest here and there. And nor is author of Proverbs. In fact, Scripture encourages the Sabbath rest. When you work hard, you need that rest. And we do need that rest, that time to rest with the Lord. But, but the text is getting at those who have those God-given talents, gifts, and abilities, and will not use them, willfully does not do all that he or she can in this life. Those who God has blessed with specific gifts, talents, and abilities, who won't use those to bless others in the community, in their families, in those around them, do you always use your gifts, talents, and abilities to God's glory? Do you always use the gifts God has given you to bless others, to serve others, to glorify God in your lives? So often the answer to that is no. So often the answer to that is no because, well, those are our things. Those are our gifts. And sometimes we, we hoard those gifts, those talents and abilities. Sometimes we hold on to them and we say, after all, why should I give to others? Why should I serve others? Why should I live my life to help others when, after all, my life has been so hard and difficult? And so we take these gifts, talents, and abilities and we don't use them to God's glory. And that's stealing from God. Now you might say, wait a minute, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, Martin Luther in his large catechism, not the small one, he has those short definitions in the, in the large, but in the large catechism he goes on for several pages when he talks about the seventh commandment. Anybody remember the seventh commandment, a little confirmation study? Thou shall not steal. All right, good. I gave you guys a couple clues, so I thought you'd pick it up. Thou shall not steal. Well, what does it mean to steal from God? It means that God gives us these gifts and these talents and these abilities, and we, do, and we rob him when we do not serve others, when we do not glorify him. We rob him of his glory. But it's more than that, isn't it? There's a first commandment that violation aspect here. There's a first commandment of, of, of this idea that, that we don't trust in God in all things. The lazy, the, the, the sluggard, the lazy bones, he or she is, is lazy because they don't trust that God will give them the strength that they need to carry out all that they need to do. They don't trust in God to give them the abilities and the time to complete all the tasks that the Lord has prepared in advance for them. And we see this in many ways. It doesn't have to be just in the workplace. Oh, I think it comes out a lot in the workplace. It shows up in the workplace in, in, in the employee who, who cuts out a little bit early and, and, and you know, makes sure they still get paid for the last you know, half hour, but their last half hour they're really just checking Facebook and surfing the internet, up, up, updating their, uh, uh, their Twitter account, right? Or maybe a little chat chat. But it also, we show, see it in school. There was a mantra that I remember when I was going to school, and it was this idea that D's get degrees. Anybody heard that one before, D's get degrees? Uh, you know, uh, well, you know, that was one that was going around, but, but that's actually a very lazy attitude. Because it's an attitude of saying, well, I'm just going to do enough. I'm just going to do enough to get by. You guys have heard that one? And maybe you see that one in the workplace, too. I'm just going to do enough, you know, to get by, to make my boss happy, to keep my boss off my back. That's a, an attitude of laziness. Or, or we see this in, in, in families. 
been a long week. Finally get home after that long week. Your feet are tired and you sit back and you throw, you throw the device at the kids and you say, I'll talk to you in about an hour. Or you see this in marriages. When you see a husband and wife who are tired, don't feel like putting in the effort, and so they're not as affectionate or, or attentive to their, to their spouse. You, you see this in, in many different ways. Uh, students in school, as we said, you, you see this in, in couples, you see this in single folks, you see this in retirees. I can't tell you how many folks I've talked to who are retired who have said, well, I don't know what I'm still doing here. I don't know what my purpose is here any longer. Well, as long as God has us here on this earth, He has purpose for us. And if we are not looking, seeking after His purpose for us, and it might not be working in a day-to-day uh, -day job, but it might be in other ways to serve others with our free time, well, that's an attitude of laziness. The author of Proverbs and I says, go to the ant. Go to the ant who, 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 doesn't, who doesn't have to be asked to do the works that need to be done. Go to the ant who doesn't have to be told eight times to complete those works. Go to the ant who does what needs to be done because it needs to be done and that's what God has created them to do. But when we go to the ant, even as wonderful creations as we are as humans, we're put to shame, aren't we? Because when we go to the ant, it shows us our own sinfulness. And so we also need to go to the cross. We need to go to the cross where the work of salvation was worked out for us by Jesus Christ, our Savior. We need to go to the cross where Jesus laid down his life for each and every one of us and paid the price for our sins. We need to go to the cross where Jesus defeated sin, death, and the devil and declared your sins are forgiven. And we need to go to the empty tomb. The empty tomb where Jesus rose from the grave and promises us that same salvation, that same resurrection. We need to go to that promise and know it as our own. But we mustn't forget to go to the ant. Because God has good purpose for us here and good works for us here. Not works for our benefit or our salvation. Not works for the benefit of God, but works for the benefit of our neighbor. You know, I, as Lutherans, we really love Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But I also have le learned to love Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. I invite you to join me in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, page 976 in those reddish Bibles. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to pick up verse 8 here. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works. So that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's something to be said about that text. Knowing that we are redeemed. That all has been done for us in our salvation. That we have been set free from our sins. And declared righteous. But then God commands of us. Those good works. Good works not for our salvation. See, that's when the problem comes, when we get those backwards. But good works that flow forth from our salvation. When we go to the ant, we are reminded that we are not just an individual in this world, but we are part of a community. Whether it be a community of, a, uh, of our workplace, whether it be a community in our homes, whether it be a community of the church or the community at large that we live in. God has placed us in these places with purposes to serve others with these good works that he has prepared in advance. These good works flow forth in response to what God has done for us. These good works come forth as we share with others and care for others, not for our benefit, not for God's benefit, but for their benefit and to honor God. When we are lazy, when we are the sluggard, we are not living, to all, living out our faith in all ways. Our love is growing weak. 
But when we live in faith, in trust, that God has given us all things, our salvation, our strength, that he continues to sustain us, then we are open and willing to share and love others. As Mr. Alfama shared with us so often, our, our, our words, we, we're good with saying our words, I love you. But as I wrap up, what actions can you do to go to the ant and show others God's love for them? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed each of us in unique and wonderful ways. Not one of us is the same as the other. And each of us uniquely contributes to the communities you place us in. In our workplaces, in our homes, in our schools, in our church. But Lord, uh, there are occasions when we, uh, when we hoard the good gifts you've given us. There are times when we, when we, we don't live out our love, when our words are empty words of love. Forgive us for those times, Lord. Forgive us for the times when we are the sluggard, when we are lazy. <laughs> Lead us by the example of such a small part of creation, the ant, who doesn't have to be asked, but lives for you each day to glorify you. Help us always remember that it is not by the good works that we do that we are saved, for our salvation was won by you on the cross but as a result of the salvation we have. We share, serve others, we love others in those good works. We thank you, Lord, that even now you promise us that one day we will be with you in the new creation. Until that day, O oh Lord, fill us with hope, with faith. Sustain us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.